pre-European arrival, early 19th century, there were at least two to three million fish that came up to the Snake River Basin every single year. Now that number is more like 20 to 25,000, about a 99% reduction in the number of fish that are coming back every year. So you have these little tiny fish, six inches long, that go out to the ocean. They come back two to five years later, and they weighed up to 80 to 100 pounds. When those fish spawn and die, all those nutrients get spread out across the landscape, the bears and the eagles that eat salmon. But then when bears do what bears do, those nutrients end up in trees, they end up in, in, in insects, and I think there's been studies that say that salmon provide vital nutrients for at least 138 other animal species here in the Northwest. Hi, uh, this is Brent, the climate guru, and we are very, very fortunate to have Mitch Cutter, the Salmon and Energy Strategist for Idaho Conservation League. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming to Boise. Yeah, I love Idaho. We're just getting to know it. Welcome. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Idaho Conservation League and what you guys do? Yeah. So the Idaho Conservation League, or ICL, as I'll say, has been around since 1973, so 51 years now. And we are Idaho's largest conservation organization. We do work on a bunch of different initiatives here in the state. The one that I work on, the one that we'll be talking about today, is on salmon and steelhead and anadromous fish. But we also do work on climate, trying to make Idaho into a carbon neutral state. We do work on public lands, trying to protect intact large tracts of public lands and also preserve access so people can get onto those public lands. We do a lot of work on water quality and water quantity across the state. So think lakes and rivers, but also things like wastewater treatment plants and mines and other things that threaten that water quality across the state wow. as well. We take a lot of pride in the, in the breadth of the issues that we work on. There's other conservation groups here in the state that work on some discrete things, but we're the, probably the one with the broadest reach. Wonderful. Uh, what the Snake River was like in its natural state before the arrival of Europeans uh, in terms of its course uh, runs of salmon and trout? Sure. So, like you said, the Snake River starts in Wyoming on the east side of the Teton Mountains um, up in the vicinity of Yellowstone National Park. It turns south from there and goes sort of across southern Idaho in a westwardly course. And then it turns back to the north, forms Hell's Canyon, which is the, the deepest gorge in North America, deeper than the Grand Canyon, before turning west again and eventually meeting the Columbia River sort of in southern Washington. Before any dams were built on the Snake River, you know, it was totally free-flowing. You would have this very large spring freshet or this big boost in flow come through in the spring. And what that really did was it helped push millions mil and millions of salmon and other fish out into the Pacific Ocean. And when dams started being constructed in the late 19th century, early 20th century to hold water or to divert water into irrigation systems or eventually to produce power, that totally messed with and changed that entire system. So if you go from the mouth of the Columbia back to Twin Falls, that's probably seven, 800 miles at least. Some of the fish that still exist that come back into the Snake and then divert into the Salmon River going into central Idaho near the town of Stanley, those fish are going 900 miles. And that is the longest fish migration of any anadromous fish in the contiguous United States and the highest elevation one as well. So we frequently like to call these fish sort of marathoners and mountaineers because of the distance that they go and also the extreme height that they go to up to six or 7,000 feet in Idaho's uh, section of the Rocky Mountains. So historically, they came all the way from the ocean, returned to the place of their birth up into the high Rocky Mountains, so six, seven, eight hundred 800 miles. But since they built the dams on the, on the river where Hell's Canyon is, can they make it past there today? Yeah, so let me be clear, there's two different kinds of dams that we're talking about here. So some dams have what are called fish passage systems. Um, most people would think of that as a fish ladder, That's sort right. of a, a concrete stairway, if you will. Mm -hmm. And those structures allow fish, adult fish, to go back upstream when they're going coming back here to Idaho, right? Some dams that were built here in the 20th century have those systems. Some other dams do not. I mean, the Hell's Canyon project, those three dams that you're talking about, do not have those kinds of structures. And so what happened was any salmon that still existed above Hell's Canyon when those dams went in were completely blocked from that habitat. And that's certainly not the first time that's happened. It happened all over the East Coast and probably most notably at Grand Coulee Dam in north central Washington, where millions of fish that used to return to the upper Columbia River, you know, in north northeastern Washington and Canada, were completely blocked when that dam was constructed there. So what after the uh, dams were built on the uh, on Hell's Canyon, can any fish make it up to the Snake River in Idaho? 
Yeah, so the Hell's Canyon dams are on what we would call the mid-Snake River. Hell's Canyon is the middle point of the Snake River. There's still a good 200 miles or so of Snake River below that, where salmon still have access. And there's a couple of tributary streams that flow into the Snake River below that as well. So the major rivers are the Salmon River, named for salmon, Clearwater River as well. Both of those are in Idaho. And then the Grand Ronde and the Amnaha Rivers on the Oregon side are probably the four most notable tributaries to the Snake River. And there are still existing fish populations in those streams because the dams they have to pass have those fish passage structures. You know, salmon life cycle is, is a little complex, but in general, most or all salmon follow this life cycle. They are born in a stream or a lake in Idaho or somewhere else. They stay there for one to two years. Eventually they migrate, they're pushed out to the ocean by this big, you know, the spring freshet, these flows that come from snow melt in the spring. They live in the ocean for anywhere between two to five years, and then they come home. They swim all the way back, sometimes to the exact 50 yard stretch of stream where they were born to spawn with other fish, lay their eggs, and then in general die. And the next generation then rises from the gravel. It's a little unclear exactly how salmon do that, actually. Some have, some scientists think it's smell, they think it's some, sort of a, a chemical in the water and particular that directs them back to that place. Others think that it's sort of a, a think of a magnetic compass in their head that sort of can help them like a GPS system does. I'm not inclined to think either way. I think that's sort of one of those mysteries that we can just sort of leave be and just sort of appreciate the magic of it. Before the dams were built along the snake, and I understand it's more than 15 dams, I've read 15, 20, how many salmon came up the Columbia into the, the snake each, each season? And how many do we have today? Yeah, so pre-European arrival here, starting early 19th century, there were at least two to three million fish that came up to the Snake River Basin every single year. Um, now that number is more like 20 to 25,000 each year. So we're talking about a 99% reduction in the number of fish that are coming back to the Snake River every year. And how far do they make it today? Yeah, so they make it, I mean, they can still make it those, in the Snake River at least, about 500 miles up to the base of Hell's Canyon Dam. We did just talk about those those tributary streams where they can go far up still. The Salmon is, I think, the second or third longest free-flowing river in the U.S. even now. So there are still existing salmon in that. There's different sorts of metrics that fish biologists use to assess how well populations are doing, how, what their health is like. And one of those is called a, a smolt to adult ratio or a SAR ratio or rate. And what essentially you're doing is you say, if I have 100 smolts, these young fish leaving Idaho, and I count how many of those fish come back two to five years later as adults, you just divide that. So if I have 100 fish that leave Idaho and only two of them make it back, that is a 2% SIR rate. And what we know as fish biologists and fish managers is that you need at least two of those fish to come back to have a sustaining population, a stable one. You need 4% to come back to have a growing population. In Idaho, what, we, what we're at right now is less than 1%. So we're not stable. We're on the decline, and that's been true for several decades. How many dams have been built on, on the uh, Snake River? You know, I don't have the exact number for you right now. Approximately. Um, approximately, I would call it 20. Okay. Can you describe how the salmon were, what they call it, keystone species? Sure. The importance they, that they gave to other other animals who, who relied upon them, even small animals, insects, crabs, how they fertilize the banks or spread seeds, and and the, and the importance to native populations. I guess it's a Nez Persons Shoshone, am I right? Yeah. When we think about salmon, I like to think about them as a bit of a, a nutrient conveyor belt, if you will. So you have these little tiny fish, six inches long, that go out to the ocean with not a whole lot of meat on their bones, right? They come back two to five years later, and they weigh, they could weigh 40 pounds. Back wow. in the day, they weighed up to 80 to 100 pounds. That's wow. how big these fish got. And you think of all of that nitrogen, phosphorus, other good stuff coming from the ocean and being conveyed back into central Idaho and other parts of the region by these fish. And when those fish spawn and die, all those nutrients get spread out across the landscape. And so you can kind of think of the obvious ones, you know, the bears and the eagles that eat salmon. But then when bears do what bears do, those nutrients end up in trees, they end up in, in, in insects. And I think there's been studies that say that salmon provide vital nutrients for at least 130 
create other animal species here in the Northwest. That's not even considering plants as part of that. They could qualify as a keystone species. They are absolutely a keystone yeah. species, yeah. And we have seen marked declines in forest health with the decline of salmon because th those nutrients aren't flowing there anymore. I see. To uh, native tribes, as per Shoshone, what was the uh, importance of the salmon runs? Yeah, you know, I won't totally retell the, the mythology that those tribes have for salmon, but I will say that, you know, salmon are a fundamental food source for them, right? They were, in their histories, they were the first species to stand up and say, I will feed humans if humans will promise to defend me for the rest you know for the rest of their existence and that covenant that sort of contract between these native peoples and salmon is still what drives those peoples today they have they swore that they would defend salmon until you know until they all go extinct and that is what sort of drives their their mission to, in protecting those fish now. And you know, salmon are not just a, a cultural religious thing. It's not a it's not a notion of give the Native American the magic fish and he'll be all better. This is a, a key economic foundation for these tribes. Tribes will catch fish and then sell them, and that's a big part of their economies. It's also a giant dietary thing for them. These people evolved for tens of thousands of years eating salmon and getting used to that diet. And when that diet got taken away from them, it was, repl is re was replaced with junk food and the usual sort of cheap things that we eat here in America. And that has just wreaked havoc on health of people who live in these tribes. And you can see higher rates of things like diabetes and heart disease as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they're trying to restore for themselves. And that's what we're supporting them and doing and trying to partner with them and getting these fish back. So I understand that there's been efforts over the last several years to try to restore salmon in the lower, in the lower snake. Billions of dollars been spent, perhaps unsuccessfully. And now there's some discussion, well, I say more than discussion, announcements by the Biden administration very recently with the states of Oregon and uh, Washington and four tribes, four or five tribes, mm -hmm. to remove four dams mm -hmm. on the lower, is it the lower? Mid, mid, the lower Snake River. Lower yeah. Snake. Uh, tell us, please, how that came about and, and what the plan and hope is. Yeah, there's a whole variety of things that impact salmon and steelhead in their migration. But the biggest of those is undoubtedly these hydroelectric dams that kill upwards of 75% of the young fish as they go out to the ocean. Right when these dams were built, people knew that they would probably cause the extinction of these species. They, that was a consequence that they knew was going to come. And when those fish were listed under the Endangered Species Act, there was a requirement to save those, to save those fish from those impacts. And these dams you know, have a known impact on salmon and steelhead populations. And you know, after trying a whole host of other things, whether it be habitat restoration or building hatcheries or controlling how much harvest on these fish happens, none of that has worked to actually create restoration for these salmon. There's been an interest for decades in restoring snake. And when did the discussion begin for removal of the four lower dams? <laughs> the discussion really began, you know, right when the dams were put in, basically. And even before they were put in, people were saying that that was a bad idea. These dams were constructed between 1955 and 1973, where these specific four, this is when these four dams were put in. It's been a discussion for a long time. I think most, more seriously, it's been a discussion for about the last 20 years or so. The Clinton administration was the last one that really put some serious thought into how, how you could reach these dams. And then really more recently, it, this conversation jump-started again with Congressman Mike Simpson, who is a conservative Idaho Republican from Idaho's second district. He represents much of Boise. He announced in 2021 a proposal to breach these four dams on the Lower Snake River, but also to provide billions of dollars of infrastructure funding to replace everything that those dams do. And the concerns of, of course, are uh, hydroelectric uh, energy generation, reservoirs, water for cities and farms. Yeah. And the other two I would toss on there are transportation. These dams create a navigational waterway all the way back to Lewiston, Idaho, making Lewiston into Idaho's only seaport, as they like to claim, and also recreation. Putting these big flat water reservoirs into the river just kind of allows a different sort of recreation than a free-flowing river would allow. So our member of Congress, Simpson, what happened after his announcement? Where did yeah. it go? Congressman Simpson put out his legislative proposal and sort of looked around the region for other co-sponsors. And he got a couple. Congressman Earl Blumenauer from Portland was probably the most notable of them. But he also got a lot of silence and a lot of Democrats saying, you know, we don't totally trust your what you're doing here. We kind of want to do our own homework. And that's when Senator Patty Murray and Governor Jay Inslee from Washington State stepped in and sort of had their own process. They did their own homework, kind of went through a lot of the effort that Simpson did and came away with a similar conclusion. We do need to breach these 
dams to save these fish populations, and all of their services are replaceable, and that's going to require a federal-state partnership to make that happen. And over the last couple of years, Washington State has gotten very involved in planning for how to do that replacement. And Washington, as a state, has been also more involved in this federal effort with the Biden administration to sort of pave the way for dam breaching and for service replacement. So it's called the Columbia Basin Restoration Initiative. Yep. And there's been a big announcement by Biden very recently. And a lot of money, I think, has been promised by the federal government, Washington and Oregon. Mm -hmm. The tribes are on board. But I understand that an act of Congress is going to be required to breach the dams. Am I right? Yeah. So these dams are federal dams in that they were federally authorized by Congress to be constructed back in the 1950s. And the theory of legal change is that to breach them, you need to deauthorize those dams by a similar act of legislation. And our hope, and I think everybody's hope, is that that legislation comes about the next couple of years to sort of create dam breaching eight to 10 years from now, and that that's also attached to a lot of infrastructure funding, like Congressman Simpson proposed, to build some of these replacement services that will be needed to, to, to replace what those dams do. So what is your hope, having talked to folks that are involved in this in this process? I know there's a meeting of the uh, Northwest Energy Coalition. Mm-hmm. What's your feeling about where it goes from here, the, the project goes from here, and what it will be needed besides congressional approval to make it happen for the Columbia Basin Restoration Initiative, CBRI, they mm-hmm. call it? Yeah. What I think is, is needed, where, where I think we're at is the administration is on a good pathway. The administration knows what must be done to save these fish, and they have sort of the right bones of the skeleton of what it looks like to to replace what these what services these dams provide. What we really need is a warm reception for that idea in Congress when it comes about. And that's what our work as an organization is is now, and that's what Northwest Energy Coalition is working on as well, is making sure that members of Congress here in the Northwest understand what's trying to be done, understand that we are earnest in truly wanting to replace everything these service, every service these dams provide and leave no one behind while also restoring these fish. Um, We have a system of winners and losers now. Salmon are losing, tribes are losing, anybody who's dependent on salmon is losing, and people who rely on the dams for power generation or transportation or irrigation are winners. They have what they want. And what we're envisioning is a future where everybody gets what they want, where all those people are still taken care of. They have reliable, affordable energy transportation, irrigation. And we also have abundant salmon and steelhead coming back into Idaho to feed our economies and ecosystems with what we need. Um, And that's the future that we're trying to envision. We were just in Congress about a month ago with a group of high school and college youth, including some tribal youth, actually, some of our youth salmon protectors organization that ICL helps to facilitate. And we met with all different kinds of um, staff and and congressional members about this. You know, I think there's I think there's a lot of support for abundant salmon. And I think there's still a lot of questions about, well, how do you replace that energy? How do you replace that transportation? And so that's what we're working on is how do we how do we get those detailed answers to those Congress people? How do we, how do they know, how can they have confidence that this is all going to work? I think that the science is there. Everybody understands that dam breaching will be a huge benefit. And the only thing that will save these salmon and steelhead. If things go well, as you hope, mm-hmm. what will be the timeline uh, optimistically sure. uh, for, for this process, for approval, for funding, for uh, local and federal agencies to get on board? Yeah. Our goal is to have legislation introduced and passed by Congress and the White House in the next three years before 2026. Um, that's our goal. That can always get moved. And when that happens, we would like dam breaching. We need dam breaching to happen in the next eight to 10 years. So before 2032, we'll say 2034, we'll say really, sorry, bad math. (laughs) Um, That is what fish biologists tell us the fish need. We have about one to two generations of Chinook salmon left before their populations are at just so low of a level that there's no hope of actually recovering them. And so that's eight to 10 years. The Chinook generation is about four or five years. After dam breaching, when that happens, you know, th- those gen- those generations matter still, right? Because when you have better survival in migration, you have more fish coming back five or six years later when they're coming back from the ocean. And that's when you see those results happen. Those fish lay more eggs, 
more fish go out, more fish come back, and you just sort of pile on the results on each other year after year after year. But it's going to take a good, you know, 10 to 20 years before you really start to see the mo most promising results and the real, you know, the results that matter. Year over year increases in populations instead of year over year decreases. So I think, you know, we have a long record now of different dam removal projects and river restoration projects that have gone very well and gone a lot faster than anybody thought they would. When they first started removing dams, they thought that it would take 10 years for this river to truly come back in a real ecosystem function and 10 years to see any more salmon than there had been before. When they removed two dams on the Elwha River on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington, they saw steelhead there the next year, yeah. where steelhead had not lived in more than a century. Wow. The river totally restored itself with some help. You know, you have to do plantings and other things like that to sort of stabilize everything within a few years. And there's another site in Washington where Condit Dam used to be on the White Salmon River, where you can't even tell a dam used to be there. That, that dam was removed back in 2012, I believe. So if you give the river a chance to do what rivers do and flow, it will restore itself. And that's what we're also going to see on the Klamath River and Southern Oregon and Northern California here over the next couple of years. They are actively breaching dams there right now. And so in in real time, we're going to see how fast this process can occur. Wonderful. How did you, on a personal note, how did you get interested in these issues of conservation, mm -hmm. of rivers? So you're, you're, what, what did you study in school and how did sure. you get involved in, in the Idaho Conservation League? Yeah. So I grew up in Central Oregon in the Northwest and I feel like just growing up in the Northwest, everybody sort of has a, uh, an awareness of salmon and dams as as a big issue, like I said, because these, this issue has been going on for so long. My interest in con conservation was really driven by a program I did in college called Semester in the West. I went to Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. And Semester in the West is a semester-long program where you, we would camp out somewhere different every three to five days, learning not from professors, but from people who actually do this work, people who have jobs kind of like I do now, as well as ranchers, authors, politicians, anybody who's working on natural resource issues somewhere in the interior west. And we talked a little about salmon on that, but more in general, that inspired my interest in things like water and public lands and mining border issues as well. And that's really where this interest came from. And so after I graduated from college, I worked as a consultant for a couple of years on hydroelectric issues, actually, for a couple of utilities here in the Northwest. No kidding. Um, and then, you know, this job at ICL opened up that was a mix of that hydroelectric dam sort of work, as well as a natural re natural resource issue in salmon and steelhead and other anadromous fish. And so, for whatever reason, they decided to hire me. And here we are about five years later. Wonderful. And it looks like you're going to be jumping between three states and, and Washington, D.C. Yep. In, in your lobbying efforts. And Mitch Cutter, it's been really enlightening to speak to you and learn all about this and, and the hopes of you and other other dedicated folks to restore these salmon runs. Thanks very much. Climate Guru, signing out. Thank you. Thank you.